Great. Yes, we did. Yes. So I'm going to be talking about interpretable image classification with two of our most recent works, ProtoPNet and IABL. And I want this talk to have both a theoretical component and also just a component where I'm explaining the code and I have a small code demo for you. So, all right, so I think most of us here should know why we want to be using convolutional neural networks in general. So in some of our earlier talks, we talked about different methods that were equally as effective as convolutional neural networks on sort of various tabular data, but convolutional neural networks in particular are very powerful in computer vision. You can also use them across multiple domains, so medical problems, plant identification, these sorts of things. And they automatically learn these features. So traditionally, if you go 80s, 90s, you have to have engineers hand code in features or wavelet features, wavelet representations, and things like this. But neural networks are able to automatically learn those features, and they don't need to be hand engineered for every application. So they also learn these unwanted associations. So here I'm gonna tell you the story of Zek and Al who wanted to diagnose pneumonia from chest radiographs. So they had some pictures of people who didn't have pneumonia and some pictures of people who did. And also in these pictures was whether or not they were taken with a standard X-ray machine or a portable scanner. And the people who needed to have portable scanners were the people who were sitting in the ICU and they were sicker and they were more likely to have pneumonia. So what the neural network learned was that if I just look at which of the machines is being used, whether I'm using a standard machine or the portable machine, I can actually make, I can get quite a bit of information from that because the people on the portable machines are likely to be sicker. So then the trained model depended on the machine used instead of on the lung or where the actual pneumonia would be in the image. So you can see why this would be less than ideal because I want some, a model that can look at the lung and tell me if it has pneumonia, not look at what type of scanner was being used. And they notice this about their own data, but there are very few ways to understand whether how um, a visual model is making these decisions. So I am completely convinced that there are many similar unwanted associations out there in trained models or reported on because there is no easy way to tell that this is the case. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the interpretable CNNs. And so what we're mean by interpretable in this is that they're going to explain their predictions in a way that humans can understand. And an inherently interpretable model not only provides explanation, but does so as an extra to what it's doing, or it's in, inherent in the model. And the explanation that's being provided is going to be faithful to the model's underlying decision process. Now, this seems like it should be a given that your explanation would explain the actual process of making the decision. However, that is not the case in a lot of explainable AI works where you get this phenomenon where someone will use one black box model to try to explain another black box model, and one is making explanations, one is making predictions, but there's no guarantee in any way that the explanation being provided relates to any of the logic that's happening in the decision. So an inherently interpretable model is going to make a make an explanation and the explanation is the decision being used by the model. So we want these faithful explanations that explain what the model is actually doing. And that's what we made. So in deployment, these are useful to have. You can comply with government regulations if you work in the financial sector, perhaps you have specific laws or discrimination laws, fair housing laws, any of these. If you're working with a completely uninterpretable model, you won't know that you're doing it, so you can't be compliant. So you, this can help you comply. You can also notice model errors immediately. So if the decision, if the explanation given by the network doesn't make any sense, you can reject that decision and, and move on. You can also provide, this can also provide useful information even if the prediction is incorrect. So if part of your decision was you have um, a red head on a bird, and part of your decision was the wing is black, and this tells you what kind of bird it is, but it misidentified the wing as being that tree trunk over there. Well, you can say, okay, that's not even the wing, so I know that you've accidentally made a mistake, but I still know that you have a red head, which was correct. So in this way, 
an inherently interpretable model, even when it's wrong, might be able to provide valuable information. Now, this also improves model development. And here's how. So the data science pipeline, depending on who shows it to you, you'll wind up with slightly different versions of this diagram, involves typically something like this. We're going to define a problem, collect data, train the model, analyze the model, refine it, usually through a series of hyperparameter tuning steps, and eventually deploy something. Now, if you're unlucky, maybe you notice when you're trying to refine that you actually need to go back and collect more data or a different type of data. And if you're really unlucky, maybe you go back and you say, oh, we're just going to try a different problem now. We re realize we couldn't do this at all. Now, what an interpretable model can help you with is with analyzing your model. So traditionally, you're only going to have accuracy or an AUROC or something like that to understand how a convolutional neural network is making a decision. You understand how good its predictions are, but you don't understand how well its logic is uh, correlating to what you're trying to learn. You don't know if it's learning what type of x-ray machine versus it learning what pneumonia actually looks like in the lung. So by having an interpretable model, you can actually improve your process of refining. And this can improve all of your model training, perhaps which data you need to collect to get a better understanding in the model. And in fact, it through knowledge discovery can help you redefine your problem in a good way, if you were able to, say, find pneumonia in a way that was better than with the existing medical state of the art is. And again, when you deploy these models, they have um, various benefits uh, of being able to see what it's doing. So you're really not only improving your model and your deployed model, but you're actually improving your whole pipeline. So a lot of people will see this interpretability as some add-on, some additional information some additional parameters that they don't want to have to work with because it's overhead. But in reality, you're actually gaining a lot in your data science pipeline by incorporating a model like this. So a way to try to sell it to somebody you're working with or some boss you have would be to say, like, not only is this going to be a better deployed model, but this might actually help us train a better, faster model that actually works. So. With computer vision, you run into the issue of what an explanation should even look like. If you have some nice tabular data, like in this corner, okay, I have patient, sorry, I have patient ID, I have age, I can make a decision tree. Decision trees, that's a nice interpretable model. Okay, now I have this image. I have gray pixel number one, slightly different gray pixel number two, slightly different gray pixel number three, uh, and so on and so forth. So if I were to make a pixel wise decision tree, it's like, all right, if you're really white on pixel one, do something else. If you're really, if you're whiter on pixel two, do something. It's not clear immediately what an explanation of an image decision should even look like. So we conceptualize something and then implemented it. And I'll explain to you what that is. So let's say we have our image on the left, and this is a picture of a bird. It's a clay-colored sparrow. And the model knows that it's a clay-colored sparrow too. And I want an explanation of why this bird is a clay-colored sparrow. So I could say, OK, the head of this bird looks like the head of a clay-colored sparrow that I've seen before. In fact, this is a special head that is very typical of clay-colored sparrows. And you know the chin part looks like the chin, and the wing looks like the wing of a clay-colored sparrow. So I'm going through and I'm pointing at sections of the image and saying, okay, this part of the image looks like that I've seen before. You know, this beak looks like some beak I've seen in the past. This eye looks like an eye I've seen before. So it gives you an explanation in the form of this looks like that, and it was especially. Um, impressive about this work was that it was able to do this on a parts basis. Instead of taking the entire image and comparing it to an entire image, it was able to say, OK, just this part of the image is particularly relevant for classification. So it was able to do this parts based interpretability. And so the paper is called This Looks Like That. 
uh, published in Europe since 2019. And it is a neural network based interpretable image classification model, which had comparable accuracy to your uninterpretable models for the same image classification. So we weren't losing on accuracy, which was important mostly for getting published, but also because we wanted to create useful models that might actually get used. So classification decision is based solely on this similarity from the learned prototypes. So we had this head prototype and it is a learned prototype. So we don't need to tell the model in advance what parts of the head, what parts of the feet, which are important. We feed it a bunch of image level labels and it learns what the most important aspects for classification are. Next slide. So here's an example of the kind of explanation that we would get out of our trained network. So here we have a test image and this is a red bellied woodpecker Yes, the, the head is the red part of a red bellied woodpecker, but that's just how that bird is named. So here we're able to say, okay, which part of the image looks like a learned prototype? And then we're also able to say, okay, this learned prototype actually comes from this piece of the training image. This particular section of this training image was found to be in our model like very relevant for classifying red bellied woodpeckers. And similarly for the wing, we have, okay, this looks like that, and this looks like that. And then we can say, okay, how much does it look like it? How similar is it? So that's our similarity score. Okay, this, this looks a lot like this. It looks 6.4 like this. And this wing pattern looks a lot like this wing pattern, 4.3. And then we multiply it by how, connect, how much does looking like this mean that you are a red-bellied woodpecker? In this case, they're 1.1. So this is the connection between this prototype and being a red-bellied woodpecker. And so you multiply these two together to get points to the red-bellied woodpecker class. And you do this for all of the learned prototypes for all of the classes to get class scores in this really interpretable way. So if you can interpret similarities and then multiplying it together to get points, then you can see what the model is actually doing. And if this doesn't look like that, you can nix that part of the model and see what result you get otherwise. So you're able to see what the model's doing. And we also implemented this for mammography in a follow-on paper. And so typically mammography works looked like this. You had some image of an X-ray of a breast lesion and you would pass it into a neural network and the neural network would say something like, yes, I think that's a malignant lesion no, I think it's not a cancerous lesion, it's something else. In this case, malignant means cancerous. And so then some people made versions that they called the interpretable versions of this, uh, which we're calling here attention only approaches because they only look at attention. And so it would still tell you, okay, yeah, this looks benign because this. And you're like, all right, this is, I see, yes, those pixels are the particular sections that are benign looking, I suppose, but in some ways, isn't the absence of something perhaps a factor? What about this section of pixels makes it look benign? There's no context provided here. So we used a basis of the prototype parts network to make this interpretable algorithm for breast lesions where we're able to say, okay, this section here looks like, this is the section blown up, looks like a known medical feature, the circumscribed margin. And we know that this is actually a sign that it's not malignant. So not only are we saying, okay, here's the part of the image that's relevant. We're saying, here's a medical feature that it correlates to. And then we further trained how much a circumscribed margin would affect malignancy and found that our model was consistent with the domain expertise in this area a good sign. And then similarly, we also are able to find in this, we can find what is the evidence, if there is any, even if it's too weak to show that the it's all the way to a possible malignancy, what is the most concerning part of this breast lesion? And that's the indistinct region at the top, which adds slightly to malignancy score. So this is a lot more, a richer explanation, which involves a lot more medical and domain knowledge than this attention only approach, which had been the only thing available in this field at the time that we started. And so a sample explanation will look something like this. Here we'd have our breast image 
And this is the particular lesion that's being fed into the network. And we say, OK, these red parts here, which are the most highly activated, these parts look a lot like this speculated prototype with a very high similarity score of 4.4. And if you look a lot like this learned prototypical lesion, that means that you're uh, close, which is closely connected to speculated, we can multiply our similarity score by our speculation score to get points for the speculated class. And then in a later step, we use these medical features to predict the malignancy. So both of these networks provide interpretability in a local form, which is here's an individual decision, here's the rationale between or behind this single prediction. And they also provide a global interpretability perspective because you can see which prototypes were used, uh, which prototypes are in the model at all. So just knowing that there's a red head prototype tells for this woodpecker class tells you that the red head is important for identifying this woodpecker class. So it gives you both global interpretability by looking at all of the learned prototypes and local interpretability by explaining each decision with the score sheet we were just looking at. In addition, we built our network to be able to use pre-training uh, because pre-training is incredibly powerful and it, depending on how much data you have, you can change your network's ability by five to 10% by using pre-trained models. And there exists a lot of them in the model zoo. And we wanted to be able to leverage this advantage. You can also swap in different network architectures. So for certain um, class, for classification tasks, perhaps VGG is going to work better than ResNet. And we built our network so that you could swap in and out the base architectures readily. So next I'm gonna go into how does it train? So we've shown you, oh yeah, it's doing similar, it's looking great, and you have these prototypes that you learned that are relevant for classification, but how is it finding these? What's even going on here? So, hope you can all see this hopefully. Oh, I've gone a little bit too far back. Here we go. How does it train? So we have our test input image, um, and we have some convolutional layers. So the first thing it's going to start with is, let's say it's part of VGG16. We're going to take the first chunk of the convolutional layers, just take off the last layer here. But we have the first n minus one layers of VGG16. Now let's think a bit about our representations here. Our image representation, it's grayscale. So it's one channel by 224 by 224 pixels. After going through the n minus one layers of the convolutional network, we're going to have many more channels, 512, and fewer spatial dimensions, six by six. So you can think of each image as a point cloud where we take our six by six by 512 uh, image pieces, and they have a point, they are a point in the 512 dimensional space. So here I've just shown you the two dimensional version, the two dimensional projection of that 512 dimensional space, because nobody wants to see a 512 dimensional image. So each image you can think of as being split up into the point cloud of all of its little pieces. And these actually have like a very strong correlation. So what is here, what representation you get in this upper right corner corresponds heavily to what is in this upper right corner. So you actually maintain the spatial correspondence when you move into this space because of the way CNNs are set up. All right, now we have all these prototypes and the prototypes are also points in the 512 dimensional space. And we're going to represent them by triangles here. All right, great. Each prototype is a point, it's in our space too. Now, what's the similarity between one of my image patches and one of these prototypes? It's going to be the inverted distance. So if you're close in the embedded space, that means that you're similar in, um, and you have a high similarity score. So great, we have all of our prototypes. And now what we're going to do is, okay, each of these, each 36 of these can be compared to prototype one. So we're going to do 36 comparisons. And that's going to give us this map of where uh, this image is similar to prototype one. All right, it seems to be in that section. 
And we do this for each of the prototypes. So we're going to have P times this, or sorry, M, which is the number of prototypes, times the size of our image when in this embedded space, the spatial size, that six by six comparisons. So we're going to be looking at the similarity between each image, each location to each prototype. Great, but I want a more, a simpler similarity score so I can understand it better for my final calculations. I want to be able to say, oh, this image looks a lot like this red head. So what I do here is I just take the maximum similarity score from this map and say, okay, that's how similar prototype one is most similar on this location. And the similarity of that is 3.9. And again, that's coming from being close in the embedded space. So when you first just make an L2 space, it doesn't naturally cluster into meaningful and useful ways. You have to train that into your network. So here we have image one point cloud, blue image, blue class, image two, red class. And we do a training step in stochastic gradient descent it to ask for a clustering structure using the clustering terms and a separation term. And the clustering term is asking each of these prototype, a patch from the blue image to be very close to each prototype and a patch from the red image to be close to the red prototypes. I'm also asking for the blue patches to be far away from red prototypes and the vice versa. So we're getting these class specific clusters. And then we want to also be able to visualize what the prototype centers look like. We don't want to say, oh yeah, it looks like this cluster. No, no. We want to say, okay, it looks like this specific piece of an image. So to do this, um, in the past, people have used variational autoencoders for this. So you learn the latent, what the latent space looks like. This doesn't work well for large number of dimensions and you have to learn um, you have to learn a second network that just says, how do I get from a latent space representation into my back into my image representation? So we sort of skipped this aspect, skipped this whole extra section by projecting our prototype centers right onto the nearest image patch. So they really are the same thing because this image patch is a five, one by one by 512. And this prototype is the same one by one by 512 uh, dimensional piece. So the prototype is that image patch. Works. All right. So now we have a bunch of prototypes, which are recognized both as these 512 dimensional vectors and as an image patch. So gives you, you're able to make these score sheets. Okay. I calculate the similarity between my image and uh, each prototype by comparing the new image patches to the prototype. So here, this one is very close to this red. So it's going to have a, this prototype score will be high, a high similarity. It's not very similar to blue. It's not that similar to yellow or green. It's very close to red again, the second red prototype. So this is going to be classified as red. All right, and then in the breast margin one, we not only found the class um, of the, uh, this is specific medical features about the breast lesion, but we also wanted to predict an overall malignancy score that was based only on known medical features. So that is how that works. And so now let's say you're convinced, you say, oh yeah, this is great. It has a theoretical backing that makes sense to me. I want to see how my image network is working. Maybe you want to apply it to your own task, you know, classifying some leaves. So let me walk you through the code base, where to find it, and uh, what you can do with it. So I am going to pop these into the chat for you all. all right. So the GitHub is going to contain only the code. The Dukebox link is, contains the minimum size download to run the demonstration. It has the test data for the birds in it. Uh, you can also download the bird data yourself and follow the instructions on how to process it to replicate these results. And this Google Drive includes both this slide deck, but it also includes all of the other files that we are about to make. 
So let's move over to the bird demonstration. And here we go. So earlier today, Google informed me that I used my GPU time. Let's see if it will. OK, we'll just look at what I did earlier. So this is set up uh, to operate in Google Colab. So if you wanted to, uh, if you had, if you wanted to train in Google Colabs, you could do so with this. Uh, this is, is mounting the drive. So this allows you to access things that are in Google Drive from inside the notebook. Very handy for if you want to save results somewhere. And this, if you hadn't downloaded um, the Git repository, this would do it for you. There's only one dependency that wasn't already in here. And you do want to check that you have a GPU available. And if not, there's some instructions on how to set it up so that it is running. Uh, this line here is going to, or these, this cell is going to make it so that you can actually um, access the code. So it puts it into the Python path. And great, after you do that, it's all set up. So I want to show two different ways to generate explanations from a pre-trained model that I've included for you. So here, we're just making sure we're in the appropriate uh, locations so that code with relative paths runs correctly. And we're going to run a bash script called C explanations. So what C explanations does is it is going to first tell you that it started running. Then for file names, and you can make a list of file names here, but I've only included the one horned puffin. It's going to perform the local analysis for you. And it's going to ask you for things like, OK, the file name, yep, we just put that in. Where is the test image so that it can go grab it? What's the label, the correct label? And which model do you want me to use to do this? Oh, and then after that, it's this is some new convenience code, which is first being released at this event, is local analysis visualization code, which will automatically create a nice little image summary of what your model just did. So when you start to generate explanations, don't worry about these warnings. That just has to do with um, new versions of PyTorch. It's still compatible. It's just a warning. Um, it will tell you, OK, what is the predicted class? What is the actual class? Great. What are the most activated prototypes? So what prototypes were you closest to? And it goes through and tells you about each of those prototypes you're close to. So it's closest to another horned puffin prototype. Good thing. It has a high activation, a high similarity score or activation value, and that's positively connected to this class. So it goes through this in detail. And when it's doing this, it's making and saving a bunch of images, which is the activation over your test image. And they are stored here in what we're calling visualizations of the explanation. And you can take a look at those. And so this is created, I guess, not as we went through this talk, but could have been as we went through this talk. And it's saying, OK, what's in this yellow box here looks like what's in this yellow box here. Or equivalently, the red part here looks like the red part there with a very high similarity of 7.7. .7. And we know that this is a horned puffin prototype which has a positive class connection to horned puffin. So it's going to give you nine points to your horned puffin score. And you can change this up so that it shows you more prototypes. If you want to, you can change it so that it shows you only from a certain class. So if you want to see, OK, if you were going to tell me that this was a woodpecker, what pieces of evidence would you use to do that? You can ask it to do that. Uh, you can also generate these explanations in a second way. So instead of calling the sort of convenience code bash file that's constructed here, if you want to change up which image is being used uh, and you want to maybe switch out the models readily, you can just call the Python files with these command line arguments. So here we're calling the Python file localanalysis.py and it's we're doing it on a red-winged blackbird instead. Same model here, which is included in the code. And this is 
doing the visualization of the local analysis, and you get this result. So here our test image, this part of our test image is closely linked to this prototype. And this is the prototype is in the yellow box here. So these look very similar. And you're able to see that it very accurately picks out the red winged piece on the black wing of the red winged blackbird for each of the prototypes. And they're each connected to the little red wing section of our red winged blackbird test image. And again, similarity scores multiplied by class contributions to give you the overall contribution to that class. So it's great, it's working. Let's say, oh, here's another example. This is a painted bunting. And uh, these are not cherry picked, by the way, these are just the first four that I wrote in. So now you wanna train a model yourself. You have a bunch of leaf data, which you've put on Google Drive. You're trying to make your leaf classifier. All right, change the model parameters in settings.py. Instead of having to go into the code and write in all of the parameters, we just put them all in settings.py for convenience. So you just go change settings.py. You can change the base architecture. You can change, oh yes, all of your images need to be pre-processed to be squares that have uh, some image size, pixel size that you write in here. Um, and then here's where you're storing that data. So we're going to need a training directory, a testing directory, make sure they don't overlap, and a push directory. So what the push directory is, is if you remember, we were projecting the prototypes onto the nearest image patch. So sometimes when you augment data, you might do things like invert the colors or skew the data in some way where it doesn't look nice as a prototype and you don't want to include those augmentations inside your push data. You don't want one of your prototypes to possibly come from that. So you can just set what you want your prototypes to come from. You can also do this if you have a partially public, partially private data set and you want to train on the private data, but you don't want to make the private data prototype. You won't want the prototypes to be available to everybody if they're from your private data. Um, various optimization. This is about uh, how you're balancing the loss function between the clustering terms we talked about to make that clustering structure, separation terms. I don't recommend changing these. It never worked for any other setting. And these are about uh, when you do projections. So in our training regime, we did a lot of clustering steps and then one projection step, and then a bunch of clustering steps, then another projection step and on a one to 10 ratio. And you can adjust that training regime from settings.py. And then once you've set that up the way you want it to train the model, run main. And this won't work in this notebook because I didn't include the training data um, in, I didn't include the training data because I didn't want it to be too much for anyone to download. However, if you want to set up the training data and retrain the model from scratch, you can find it in the readme of the code base. It tells you how to unpack CUB 200, which um, pieces of information to use or how to process it to get the exact same results. And then just for you guys, I wanted to talk about some practical tips for training this. So if you want to train this, first, you need to set up all your data so that it's squares. Now you want to keep in mind that this method is remarkably sensitive to the latent space dimension. So this channel depth where it was 512 in our demonstration, uh, depending on the application, you may get optimal results anywhere from 32 to 1024 as your latent space channel dimension. So if it's not working, try changing that, see if that helps. Uh, additionally, some data types are going to benefit from instead of taking your maximum most similar patch in a given image, take your maximum two or three patches in a given image. And this is especially important for medical domain information. And in fact, somebody else uh, redid our, used our model for doing chest CTs and they did a global mean pool instead of a max pool in order to stabilize their training data. And we implemented a top K for our medical application as well, um, which you can find here. And the scale of the prototype is important for what you're doing. So depending on your application for the birds, it made a lot of sense to have, we had a seven by seven piece image instead of six by six as shown before, but seven by seven image. 
and each prototype was size one by one. So it turns out that you know a 50th of the image works really well for explaining birds. That might not be true for every application. So you can change your prototype size by going into this prototype size in settings. You could change it to a two by two or a two by one. And you can also change it by changing um, the scale of your input image. So if you just put 336 in here instead of 224, then you're going to get a uh, different granularity. And so that is how you can use this code base to make your very own interpretable network or use ours and play around with it. Just want to talk a little bit about who I am. So I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at Duke University. My advisor is Professor Cynthia Rudin, who we saw her talk earlier today. And I work in interpretable computer vision with medical applications, writing custom architectures, objectives, and training methods to develop interpretable methods. And these incorporate domain knowledge and communicate the rationale in a way that doctors can understand. And I'm very happy to work with a number of wonderful, talented people who really believe in this work, um, including our doctor, our radiologist who developed the idea of, with me of how we could extend our bird network into something that could be useful for physicians. And uh, Chao Fen, an undergrad who worked very closely on the mammography project with me and is now graduated and gone to Facebook. We're very proud of him. And of course, uh, my professor, my advisor, and my uh, committee members for assisting me. This work is supported by Tripods, the Duke Computer Science Department, the Duke Incubation Fund for um, Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and MIT Lincoln Labs. And I will take any questions at this time. Thank you.